Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. My name is Meredith Gershenson, and today we are going to talk a little bit about best practices for managing stadium staff. We're hoping that Jim, just in the nick of time, Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm having some computer problems for whatever reason, so I'm going to have to do this with this with the cell phone. I no guess. worries. We're just happy to have you joining us. Um, we're just getting things kicked off. Uh, so as you guys can see, we are joined today by the Executive VP and General Manager of Levi Stadium, Jim Mercurio. Jim, thank you so much for coming. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So Jim is in his 28th year with the San Francisco 49ers and his third as Executive VP and GM of Levi Stadium. He oversees all aspects of stadium and event operations, including executive oversight of the food and beverage operations, engineering, grounds, guest services, janitorial services, operations and logistics, parking and transportation. And on top of that, Jim also manages all police, safety, and security services, including 24-7 stadium security operations and game and event day medical services. Jim, I'm so excited to have you on. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Again, sorry for having to do with this remote, but no we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it. That's the beauty of technology. Indeed. Um, That's awesome. We are also joined by Bo Gersnich. Bo is our senior business consultant and head of solutions here at Workforce.com. Bo, it's good to see you again. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Of course. So Bo has been able to run successful projects for clients of all sizes and all industries, helping them to see real value in their time and attendance with their scheduling and time and attendance software. He has worked on a variety of sports and venue organizations, most notably the Winnipeg Jets, Lake House North Storm, and True North Sports and Entertainment. To give everyone a very quick run through of our webinar platform here on the right, we have our chat box. Feel free to throw in any questions you have uh, throughout the webinar. We are going to do a formal Q&A with Jim, so please be sure to throw those questions in there. We have a couple of uh, poll questions throughout the webinar itself. Those will just slide up on the bottom left of your screen. Feel free to interact with those. We love to hear from you all. Uh, we do have an audit, a performance, uh, a venue performance audit for the very end that I will hand out. Um, be sure to fill that out. If you do fill it out, there's a lucky winner for an $100 Amazon gift card. And finally, to give a little background on Workforce.com, we are a workforce management software company who specializes in scheduling and time and attendance. And really, our overarching goal is to help business leaders and frontline managers just make the best decisions for their company at the end of the day. Cool. To get things kicked off, um, Jim, I'd love for you to tell me about how you found yourself at Levi Stadium and just a little bit about the type of events that are held there. Well, as you said, this is, um, you know, it's been not my first rodeo, right? I've been here uh, since we opened up the stadium. It's actually 20, I'm going on 30 in April, uh, 30 years with the San Francisco 49ers and started at Candlestick Park as a, as a younger guy with less gray hair for certain, but um, when we transitioned from Candlestick to, to Levi Stadium, it was really one of those things that, uh, you know, we're ending one era and starting another in terms of stadiums and really uh, with respect to event management on, on what type of events and the number of events that we would have uh, certainly drastically uh, increased comparative to what we had at Candlestick Park, right? For Candlestick, we just managed our football games for the most part on occasion, we may have a soccer or a concert that we would help manage. Well, when we moved to Levi stadium, it meant managing the stadium 24 seven, the physical plant uh, and any and every single large scale and small scale catered event as well. So I find my, I was born and raised in San Francisco. Uh, so it's about 45 miles South of San Francisco and in Santa Clara. And, uh, I, I just, uh, it was a kind of a natural transition for me from Candlestick to the new stadium. Got it. And what are some of the different um, businesses or aspects that are run out of Levi Stadium? Well, comparatively speaking, like I said, we just had um, football, right? That's all we really concerned ourselves with. The physical plant was probably the biggest change for us. Engineering operations, uh, all trades, um, the 24-7 operation of the building was was at candlestick ran by the city of san francisco or the park and recs department that now was folded up underneath my my watch mm -hmm. in addition to that all the catered events the the smaller events the corporate events the corporate buyouts things of that nature mm -hmm. where um when you look at stadiums today they're not just football stadiums or baseball stadiums they're entertainment venues right and in some cases um 
you know, I liken Levi Stadium to a mid-sized convention center with 70,000 seats, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And Bo, yeah. I'm sure you could kind of relate to that a little bit as well with some of the. Yeah, the thing I love about stadiums is that, that whole like 70,000 part where, you know, at peak capacity, you really are taking in an entire city, basically, all under, you know, one roof or, or one facility. And so you, there's, there's so much that goes into how you feed and take care of and, you know, make sure the enjoyment levels are, are high for an entire city. Can you imagine doing that? Like, just within, uh, you know, small town America, like just you're, taking you're, giving, you're giving me goosebumps, Bo. I tell you, yeah. it really is a city within a city. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's awesome. You're, you're swelling the amount of people that you're bringing in on a, a certain game day, for example. Um, yeah, in some in some cases, uh, you know, doubling in some towns, depending upon you know where it's at, you could be doubling a a uh, the capacity. So you got to make sure from start to finish, from driveway to driveway, is what we like to call it that you're taking taking care of the necess the necessary items associated with event day your traffic it starts with parking and traffic and ends with parking and traffic in many cases right, right. so anything sure. in between there. so you want to make sure that you have all of the capacities uh, to be able to fulfill not just the 70,000 people that are coming in but all the surrounding cities uh, community needs uh, that are still happening while you're swelling to 70 grand in, in your uh, in your venue to give the audience some perspective on, you know, just how big of a map we're looking at, this is a good visual that actually depicts um, directly from the Levi Stadium website on how many people you're managing, Jim. So you're right in the center there. Um, and it's amazing to see all the different teams and, you know, everything that goes into creating an event, a night, or even just a day um, dedicated around a football game, a soccer match, a concert, whatever it might be. Um, and just, it's amazing to me. So I would love to hear, you know, what your thoughts are and what's the importance of each of these teams and making sure that an event comes to fruition, that, it, you know, your attendees are happy. You know, when I first saw this slide, um, I thought, geez, you really got it. You nailed it. It's on the head. Now it's executive management. That just doesn't necessarily mean one person, right? Mm -hmm. there, there, you have an executive management team and in many cases you have a director or a VP for every single one of those Um like I, as I'll refer to them as a spoke, right? These are, if you look at that circle, it's a wheel in the middle of that, uh, in many cases, the stadium operations and, and you have the spokes of the wheel for accounting and, and premium service and engineering and security and ticketing and legal and guest services and all of those important things or every one of those spokes um, are important. And if you have a disconnect with any of those, as you're trying to roll your wheel down the road, Right. It becomes a little bit of a clunky uh, experience. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we like to say, hey, uh, with respect to the operation of the building and the operation of the event, all of those things um, are equally as important. And if you don't have a connection with those, um, you're going to have some difficulty. And so that's why we try to pride ourselves on the up and down uh, communication or inside outside communication between my team in every one of those departments. Now, many of those um, we can we manage or control directly: grounds and guest services, and stadium operations, and security, and um, st you know stadium and event operations and engineering. But most of those are underneath my purview, but all the others uh, are not. But we work with them directly, so to make sure that um, you know each of those corporate partners, for example. Uh, we have a direct line of communication to them to make sure that their needs are met and that we support them how, how, how we need to. Um, but each one of those has a, a leader, so to speak, or a VP or a director or an executive VP uh, in charge of many of those services that we provide. And uh, it's important that you keep those folks, you know, in a tight circle. Right. Right. That's a great point. And, you know, I'm curious as to what your day to day looks like. Um, as executive VP compared to on versus off season, you know, how do the, uh, yeah. how does the job fluctuate? You know, it, it used to be that we had an off season. <laughs> we don't, we don't so much uh, have that anymore. And, right. and um, <laughs> when we don't have a home game, we either have a concert or we have a soccer game mm -hmm. or we have a couple of corporate events. Um, I, I, I think, you know, it it's um, 
it really depends upon, you know, the kind of season, right? If, if there's a budget planning season, uh, you're always executing on events. And so, like I told you earlier, it's not just a football stadium anymore. It's an entertainment venue. And so mm -hmm. um, I, <laughs> uh, we do enjoy when the 49ers go away and, and on a away trip because we might get a weekend uh, off or mm -hmm. at least a weekend from, you know, having – 70,000 fans over and I'm not saying we have it every single weekend but um, for example now we're starting a six I think it's six out of the last seven games are at home here at Levi Stadium for the 49ers which is a great thing hopefully competitively for us because they don't have to travel right. but, yeah. for, but for my staff what that means is you know 45 days straight in many cases without a day off and so oh my God. Um, and we can kind of talk a little bit about the importance of people and personnel and how you you treat them but it's important that you you do everything you can to um, celebrate those types of individuals and doing everything you can to keep them uh, safe and sane so to speak yeah definitely definitely i sent out a poll question um asking the audience what sort of events does your organization host if any you know if any i.e sporting events concerts a mixture most of them are saying concerts and corporate events um some are saying you know a mixture of both so it's interesting to see um you know that the idea of off season doesn't necessarily exist to the full extent that we you know maybe yeah. would like to believe from an operation standpoint so i find that very interesting yeah, because you got to remember when we're not hosting a game, um, you're doing something, whether it's preventative maintenance um, or you're, you know, something breaks, uh, you've got to you got to replace it and fix it. Nothing lasts forever. And so you're always constantly looking on the physical plant side, which is in some cases uh, the less sexy side of the job, right. uh, keeping the lights on at all time and the power up and going. Uh, is it just doesn't happen, right? There are actual people that uh, really work to keep that going, and strategically work, um, you know, in the in the preventative maintenance side of the preventative maintenance world, uh, to ensure that you have a better success for when you have those events that you got to turn them on and turn them off. Right, that's a great point, Bo. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, keeping tabs on your staff and making sure that everybody is uh, on the same page and um, you know working together. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, with event management, unlike maybe a storefront or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, companies that uh, would work like a nine to five, uh, you really focused in on a certain period of time, call that like three hours, five hours. And so uh, the time in which you're, you're operating, you know, is, is all critical. And so I think you need to, uh, like what uh, Jim was sharing, maintain those really strong uh, communication um, venues with people who can get things done really quickly. Yep. Uh, the worst thing is if something goes wrong within an event and you don't have a really quick reaction to it. Because again, if you only have three hours and you know uh, something goes wrong at the bar for an hour of it, that's you know, a loss of potentially 33% of the revenue from that, that bar for the night. And so uh, keeping strong communications, a really good reactive um, mentality for anything that might go wrong, as well as that preventative side, making sure that those, those kind of situations don't, don't happen in the first place. It all comes down to communication, uh, comes down to uh, trusting your employees and, and keeping good, uh, good people employed. Definitely. Yeah. And we'll kind of dive into that aspect a little further down the line. I would love to point to this slide. Uh, we actually got this from an article um, from the Star Tribune, actually. And it's talking about what attendance levels looked like pre-COVID versus post-COVID. If you look at that first quote, um, it's talking about the Twins. And uh, before the pandemic, the Twins averaged around 30,000 plus fans per game. This year, that dropped to 22,000. Uh, Jim, I'm curious, you know, have you guys experienced any of this being in that industry that was very heavily impacted by the pandemic? And kind of what that's looking like now on the other side. Yeah. Listen, just a short time ago, we were told that we couldn't play mm -hmm. at Levi stadium. We had to move our games to our friends uh, at the Cardinals to host us for five games. I think it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, imagine uh, uprooting um, the entire team and the entire team operation to another venue for a long, long time because you couldn't by city law, 
um, we couldn't gather, we couldn't host. And then we, we had a couple games where you had no fans. And so the amount of employees you had significantly dropped, but you still had quite a few from the fact that you got to broadcast and you got to, you got to, again, power and lights and, you know, operational things. Uh, so we were, nice. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was the most um, kind of eerie feeling sitting in a, uh, in the command post or in the, in, or in a, just a, an empty suite, right. uh, listening to the call of the, of the play, so to speak, uh, and hearing um, the banter back and forth on the field between the players uh, for one. And what I remember most oddly enough was sitting in a, in one of the boxes or a suite that I was watching the game from hearing the refrigerator fan, Oh no. <laughs> right. That's how, that's how quiet it was. And so, yeah. and it was, it was an unnerving, it was boring. It was, um, it was just, just a terrible, honestly, a terrible experience. Right. Um, now, um, you know, we've seemed to be coming out of that, right. I mean, the number of fans that we had here just for the Kansas city game, uh, a couple of weeks ago was, you know, almost one of the higher attended games that we've had here at Levi stadium. So oh, wow. we're getting, we're getting past that. I mean, we're still cautious. We're still, uh, you know, practicing as, as many of those safety protocols as possible uh, making people feel comfortable and safe, inclusive of employees. Right. And so we're starting to see uh, employees come back to the workforce. I would venture to say with some of the news that just kind of hit us this week, uh, sadly, uh, you know, you're, we're, we're finding ourselves potentially in a, a recession or heading towards that recession. Inflation right. is high and people are having to do more with less or find other alternatives to have that second job. And so mm-hmm. when you see large companies laying off large swaths of people, though it's sure. terrible for those folks, it, I think it will benefit people that are uh, looking for secondary employment or companies that are looking for those three, four, five hour jobs you talked about, Bo. Um, so I think from the service industry, I could see um, that service industry coming back a little bit as a result of, you know, the unfortunate layoffs that some of these folks are experiencing. That's interesting. I'm curious, you know, taking into account the different types of events that are hosted, not just football, right. Um, at Levi stadium, uh, what, you know, how do they differ in terms of the staffing levels, um, in terms of scheduling that staff, in terms of generally making sure that everybody's having a good experience? You know, is there any true difference in how you put on these events? Well, there's a core foundation that I like to tell, um, you know, my team. And one of, one of the, which this year uh, was it's time to get back to basics. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and what I meant by that and what I still mean by that is, you know, growing your base, growing your foundation, um, remembering the small things, um, because a lot of times those, those are the things that matter the most. And so uh, that was kind of our kind of mantra. It still is, I think, going through the, this. Just get back to basics. Don't don't just assume that everybody knows what you want them to do or what your policies are right. for your fans. Um, but uh, I equally stress the importance of the 3,500 plus game day employees who may or may be with you for the first time or for the first season or for 32 years, right? I mean, you, you, you need to communicate to your employees what the expectations are. You need to provide them with the tools necessary to do the tasks that you're asking them to. And oh, by the way, if you treat them as, as you uh, treat the, your customers, um, they're going to become an employee and hopefully a customer for life. So I, I think there's no difference between how we treat a customer as we try to treat our employees. They are an internal customer is how I look at it. And so my expectation is to make sure that you give them, uh, you know, the tools necessary to succeed. And, and remember, these folks are representing uh, you. They're representing me. They're representing our city. They're representing the organization, Levi Stadium, all the way up to our owner. And so I want that to be um, kind of drilled into their mindset that mm-hmm. it's not just a four or five hour. Oh. Looks like his connection went off. Oh, um, you know, I think you, you're, you're doing what it is we should be doing. And mm-hmm. I just got to remember, and I, I tell this to, you know, 
you know, sometimes what we'll do is we'll do an employee of the game, for example. <clears throat> and one of the things I'll explain to them is when people come to Levi Stadium and they invest, you know, the four, five, eight hours that they're doing, they're, they're trying to escape the everyday realities of life. And sometimes those realities in life are such that that stress is so overwhelming. <clears throat> and so yeah. you've given them an opportunity. They've given us an opportunity to share with them their life and their eight hours of their life. It's our opportunity. It's our obligation to ensure that they have the best time possible. And when they, when they get an award, the employee, and I'm explaining to them the importance of why they're getting that award and, and the impacts they're making on a fan's life. You, you can see it in somebody's face and their eyes on, on a different mindset they, that they had of the job. And right there that starts to spread and permeate yeah. throughout the workforce. So I, I, oh, I so think great. it's between people, process and technology. If you don't have those three in line, <clears throat> you're going to have a bumpy road, but I always remember and believe that it starts with people and ends with people. Bo, I saw you nodding along there. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, Jim, Jim's got me ready to go into the game right now. That's, that, was, that was a great, uh, great quote. Did I lose um, you? Oh, nope, you're there. there. Can you hear us? Cool, but. Uh, Anyway, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. I think with stadiums and with uh, teams and, and event men or uh, venues is uh, we talk a lot in recent years and post COVID on like remote teams and uh, distributed communities and moving a lot of things online. The reality of stadiums and of event venues is that everyone that works there is in person for the most part, right? And so they're members of the community and oftentimes like Jim are, you know, lifelong residents of those areas. And so they're probably fans since childhood. So you have that passion component of, uh, you know, really loving the 49ers or loving the Winnipeg Jets or whatever uh, team you grew up watching or uh, being a part of. So it's, it's this cool passion opportunity where if you can really invoke that, as it sounds like Jim's doing on his side, mm -hmm. um, uh, you can create a culture that will, will really feed off itself and, and really lend to the fan experience, which is the ultimate uh, you know, goal of the, the whole endeavor. Right. right? Yeah, Bo, I'm curious, um, as a follow-up to what Jim was saying, and going back to the basics, have you seen or experienced any organizations that – might have swayed away from ensuring, you know, even with technology like workforce, you know, they kind of swayed away from going to the basics and making sure that they're treating their customers as, or excuse me, their employees as internal customers. Yeah. So like a, a specific story of that or. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if I have uh, anything to share besides maybe when uh, eating out the times in the pandemic where there weren't allowed to, to have fans in the right. stadium, I think it's much harder to visualize the actual experience. Um, and so I think in the components of getting creative uh, ideas were thrown around and shared that uh, probably have, have been uh, left back behind in, in those, you know, in that era of uh, sports management. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably because, you know, it was it was good stopgap measures, but the reality is that those basics are what got people to really love going to events in the first place. Right. You know, this is ingrained in uh, humanity. You know, the the Colosseum built by the Romans. It's uh, you know more or less your first football stadium, right? Right. So um, the the true basics is that spirit of camaraderie. Um, once people are in the arena, giving them a good experience. Uh, I think that the basics uh, really come into play really strongly there. Yeah. And as we're waiting for Jim to hop on, there's some technical dip. Oh, there we are. Perfect no, I, timing I, as always, Jim. Just in time again. <laughs> yes. All right. Can you hear us okay? I can. Awesome. Awesome. So I was just going to, I was about to ask Bo, and I'd love your thoughts on this too. Um, you know, what are some of the more common mistakes that you're seeing stadium operators make when it comes to correctly staffing to demand? Well, yeah, I think for us, um, one of the things that I, when I, I, before I got knocked off, um, 
I had talked about, um, you know, getting back to basics. And so um, one of the things we implemented was making sure that staff called full-time staff or part-time staff called the 800 um, guest services team members to confirm that they're coming to work today. <clears throat> and one of the reasons we started to do that was for the exact reason why Bo started to talk about, hey, if somebody doesn't show up today, it really affects your bottom line. Or it, for us, it started to impact or potentially impact, you know, the overall game day experience, right? So the, the time of the line starts to be affected because I don't have enough uh, concession workers or we don't have enough security guards uh, checking the gate. So it just means that everything slows down. <clears throat> and so what we started to do was kind of verify, hey, making sure, hey, look, at thanks for coming Sunday. You look forward to seeing you and really get the commitment just to remind people, hey, we're coming in. And then it started to become, hey, you know, Kieran, you don't have to call me every uh, time or uh, <laughs> Andrew, you don't have to call me. I'm coming. I promise you I'm going to be here. Right. And so we, ha we we just we started that this season and the amount of uh call outs has significantly reduced, which has been fantastic. Um, in terms of mistakes that we've made, listen, I, I wish we would have, and it's not so much with people. I think we would, I, I wish we would have did a little bit more on the outside of the building uh, than we did focusing on the inside of the building in some cases. Um, we got a unique kind of experience here where we were sharing a parking lot with Great America. Um, and so there's a couple challenges there. They've been fantastic partners, <clears throat> but if there was a way to kind of, you know, put a little bit more political capital at the time of construction, I think right. I might have done that. But I mean, you know, sometimes you can only stand on top of the table and scream and beat your fist that this is important before somebody says, "Hey, we have to move forward and we're going to build this thing." So, yeah. <clears throat> no regrets. But I think um, in that protect kind of arena i would i would have looked to spend a little more time in some of the gate structures the gate setup for example definitely bo i'd love to hear your thoughts on that specifically on the topic of call outs yeah in the uh the workforce.com world we would call that like shift acknowledgement uh which is really common especially with uh people who have a lot of uh part-time staff or uh minors in their uh, facilities who are a little bit more prone for those those no call no shows uh, shift acknowledgements really in mass are just uh, you know when you schedule someone it's that mutual connection where they acknowledge that this shift is what they're going to work and that they're going to be there right yeah. and even giving them the opportunity to deny those shifts at minimum I, I tell people like if someone declines a shift that you've scheduled them for at minimum you know that they don't want to go there and so like you could call them and ask them, hey, no, you have to come work here or you could just find a replacement or, you know, the the real difficulty is in that moment of unknown where someone, you know, doesn't say anything and doesn't show up. If they tell you in advance, even, you know, 48 hours, you at least have the opportunity to, you know, respond and react to that. And so shift right. shift acknowledgement is a really great feature, uh, especially with event management. Yeah, for us, what one of the things that's most important, though, is you got to have, uh, you know, your primary plan, but then you got to have a secondary plan, right? And so oh, yeah. what I mean by that is, so if you look at it from a stadium's perspective, um, you know, staffing inside the building versus outside the building. Well, if your gates aren't open at 11 o'clock and you're short people on the outside, well, you can you can steal people from the inside to work the outside. So you sure. should have you should have a plan that says, look, if we get you know a ten percent call out, for example, and we can't staff the gates as uh, to capacity that we need, well, then we'll pull people from the inside to cover that. And then as fans start to move on the inside of the building, we redeploy them back to their original spot. We have a we kind of have a a okay, great. Here's plan A if everybody shows or the majority of people show. Right. Great. Plan B that states, all right, while well, they haven't really showed, but um, or they're late, uh, while the gates, there's an initial rush at 11 uh, o'clock in the morning, uh, but the big rush happens at 12 and then again at 1230 to one. So just make sure that you can staff those spikes 
uh, with respect to entry gates. And then you can redeploy those folks from the outside to the inside. So if you have that thought process going in, you'll be more successful than if you just hoped and prayed somebody showed up. <laughs> and and, and uh, so I would encourage you folks, and, and this is not nothing, I don't think that's you know, transformative or anything, but I think it's just a reminder to maintain you know, f- some flexibility in your staffing model to allow for that. Definitely. Yeah. Something I've, I've found really interesting working with uh, stadiums, which I hadn't really recognized as a fan is, uh, you know, when, when you think about the progression of a game, you kind of know because you're watching that moment that, uh, you know, here's the start, here's the middle, here's the end. And you can kind of see people as they move around. But uh, when it comes to the scheduling component of it, uh, it's so much more than just what you're seeing Uh, as people go through those different jobs and like, you know, you don't need the security on the outside as much during the middle of the game compared to, you know, after and before. And and so the, I do see a lot of flexibility of of people cross training and moving around and and making sure that uh, in the same way that the game kind of flows. So too does the supporting staff that, you know, are are making it all possible. Mm. But there's, but there are things that change that, right? So the outcome sure, yeah. of the game, for example, right? So, <laughs> so if you think about football in quarters, for example, right? You know, the first quarter starts, the the uh, flyby goes, the national anthem sung, football's on the play, it kind of tones down a little bit, and then as you start to gear up for halftime, and then you start to gear out for a beer closure at third quarter, well, that's all fine and dandy, but if the 49ers are getting pounded and we're losing uh, by two touchdowns or three touchdowns and fans don't think that we're coming back. There goes the mass exodus, right? So you have to be in front of that. So yeah, that's, those that's folks that you are point. redeploying to the inside of the outside, now you're never going to just redeploy everybody from the outside in. You're, you're going to have a base deployment, but those that you're bringing inside that would normally go out there, say at the end of the, third quarter or midway through the fourth quarter now has to go out there at the third quarter. And so that, that kind of plays around and screws up your, your plan. And so the employees have to be reminded that's where management comes in. That's where good supervision comes in that says, Hey, uh, we're going to, we're going to redeploy you back out to the parking lot or back to the gates, you know, 30 minutes earlier than we normally do. And so that mm-hmm. could be a little disruptive, for your team and staff, but there's got to be somebody that's paying attention to that stuff. Yeah. Hopefully that's happening a lot less with uh, Christian McCaffrey in town. Now, right? <laughs> from, from your lips to everybody's ears, right? That's yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, you're making me think when you're talking about your plan A's, your plan B's, how, you know, security has to swap out depending on the time of the game, whenever the concert's happening, whatever it is. You know, with so much going on within a singular event, how do you stay on top of it? All? How do you stay on top of it all? I'm curious. You know, how you maintain that uh, that bird's eye perspective over everything. Well, technology has been a has been a godsend for for a lot of this, right? Back mm-hmm. in when I started, 1994, we were using pen and paper and maybe Excel uh, to track calls and. Hey, we had a we have a fight in section two oh one, or we have a slip and fall here, or we've got a medical call in section one oh three. And then you'd you know you'd kind of pass it back to the guy or gal that's dispatching those services. Now we've got you know computer aided dispatch, a CAD system, which is what you would see in police and fire services. We have that for event staffing services. So every one of the folks that have game day responsibilities. So let's think about it, police, fire, guest services, ticket taking, security, parking, janitorial, on and on and on. They have what we call a dispatch manager um, and who communicates on their specific channel on radio or communicates through computer or text or whatever means of communication we have them on. And all that rolls up to what we call a dispatch queue. And that dispatch queue, uh, I can monitor from anywhere. I can on my phone or I can sit in my office and I can see the screen and the number of calls for services, what we refer to them as. And and there's they come in red. Uh, they get dispatched. It's green. If it's in limbo, it's yellow or in process. And if it's completed out, it's kind of gray. So I'll be able to look at that computerized 
um, dispatch queue to say, okay, why do I got eight calls for service that are still red? And th that gives me a trigger that I can say, okay, what's, what's going on now? I can turn on certain filters of where and what I want to be concerned about. If it's uh, a medical call, um, immediately it pings me, right? I could say, okay, or I'm listening it to the radio. There's a lot of multitasking going on, but yeah, it's not just me, right? It is, it, it is every one of those folks that I talked about and the managers and directors associated with those folks and your team of experts and people that you rely on um, and trust. And quite frankly, have been with me for quite some time that, mm -hmm. um, you know, they know what my expectations are, but my ex it's it's less than that now. It's really more their expectations. And so I think I've gotten it to the point in time where the type of people that I've got employed, um, I can't hold them to a higher standard. I can't hold them to a higher standard than they hold themselves to. And if you get there, uh, if you can get that type of employee, um, in my view, you've made it. Yeah. And that's where I, I celebrate and appreciate uh, more than you can imagine the people that work for me uh, on a full-time basis, uh, equally as on a part-time or event day basis, how much I appreciate the dedication they have to their craft because mm -hmm. it really speaks volumes to the type of people that you, you want to try to employ. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to hear you talking about the idea of loyalty and especially for someone, you know, in your position, in your role, who has all these teams of, you know, to oversee and to maintain that bird's eye perspective with. It's really humbling to hear you talking about that loyalty and even talking about the people that are working concessions to the people that are doing the ground keeping. So that, that's, um, that's very respectable. Uh, Bo, I would love to hear, you know, taking um, Lake Elsinore Storm, a minor league baseball team into consideration. We did a whole case study on them a while back and they talked a lot about having issues with their visibility. I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts on that and how um, that was resolved. Yeah, I think uh, visibility in that context was uh, really about those no call, no shows. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, when you don't have a centralized way of people clocking in and out or, uh, you know, the technology in place that lets you see in real time, uh, who's been, who's in the building, uh, when did they clock in, who's running late. Uh, it's a lot harder to be reactive when those uh, individuals end up no call, no showing. And, you know, to Jim's point with plan B's and even plan C's, uh, if you're late on deploying those, then that's, uh, you know, it can be a negative to the, the plan in of itself. And so having that data in real time, knowing that, hey, we have a problem at foot, like it's been 15 minutes since, you know, 115, 100 people were supposed to come, you know, we're, we're up to 70% of them in, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got, you've got to react. And so uh, that visibility is key to allowing you to uh, maintain the level of uh, the level of the experience that you're trying to share uh, while facing the realities that your staffing levels are, are currently at. Right. All right. Again, treating your employees as internal customers, as Jen was saying earlier, I think that's such a key, key principle. And, um, you know, we've run these webinars in the past uh, for, you know, specifically HR specific webinars, and um, they're always preaching that and that aspect of communication and treating them, you know, as you would a customer. And I, I just think that's so important when it comes to visibility and making sure everyone's on the same page. It's giving them that respect. Um, I would love to uh, talk a little bit more about turnover, the guest experience and labor costs and how it all kind of feeds into each other. Um, you know, a good jumping off point would, again, going back to the idea of how life is now post pandemic. Um, you know, Jim, has the guest experience changed since COVID? Um, you know, what does that look like in terms of foot traffic, customer spending habits? And so on before? Yeah, I think um, a couple different things. One, um, with respect to keeping employees and, and maintaining or trying to maintain levels and, and reduce turnover. Mm -hmm. Um, simple things like um, a welcoming packet when they arrive. Uh, in some cases, we actually do, we feed, we, oh, on all cases, we feed our employees now and have for quite some time. 
Um, some of it's real simple. Some of it's just, it could be a, a fruit or a snack or something like that when they arrive, a little kind of brown bag. Uh, and then a hot meal goes so such a long way. The problem is there's some logistics with that yeah. when you're trying to feed that many people. Um, so we, we balance that between a box lunch and a hot meal and shifts and schedules. So there's a whole operation that you got to be mindful about that, plus a budget uh, that, you know, unfortunately some of us don't have that fortunately the ownership uh, and the family here at the 49ers of York family uh, allow us and value those principles. And so uh, it's important for us to be able to do that. Parking is, is another uh, opportunity of where you can impact an employee's life. It used to be that, you know, you have everybody uh, who are coming to your game and your customers are real close and you bust in your employees, you park them from some far away. Right. I've actually flipped that upside down and try to get our employees to park as close as we can. Wow. Does a couple different things for us. One, it reduces the amount of time and wait time that you will have to pay them anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but it makes them feel like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I, this is great. I, I'm appreciated. And, and I want to come to work. I don't mind coming to work. I don't have to, I don't have to walk 16 blocks and get on a bus and then wait for the bus to come and the shuttle to come later. So I think those are two simple, maybe, maybe not simple, but, um, they they are costly in some cases, but, um, again, it's a, a there's a balance between, you know, how you can treat your customer and how you can treat your employees. And those are two things that I've noticed uh, helped with retention. You got to pay, you got to pay them, right? There's no doubt about it. In in California, um, certainly in San Francisco, Bay Area, it's one of the highest uh, markets, right? And so it's very difficult to live here um, with, without the commiserated um, salary. And so, you know, from COVID to now, um, you know, we, we've had to raise our rates because, um, and, and a little bit more than normal, because of the fact that the job market people were choosing. Ah, I don't want to make. I don't want to work anymore. I can go make more money doing this. Right. So you got to be mindful about that sort of thing. And then, lastly, I would say, is um, f- f- and it's I'll brag here. Again, I'll brag on our ownership. Um, the York family during COVID could have said, just like many other teams did, look, I got to lay you off. We, we're not, we're not bringing in revenue. We're not having events. I, I, and they didn't do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they employed the entire full-time team. They even, um, you know, did several things to kind of help uh, where other franchises or other industries just didn't. Right. And so right. I'm forever grateful for that. And what that does is it signals to employees that Jesus, you know, these guys really do care about me. Mm-hmm. And that's another reason why I want to continue to work here for the 49ers is because they, uh, they promote that. And right. so I think when you think about a culture, all of that um, weighs in on whether or not your retention levels are going to stay where they need to be. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that turnover uh, has significantly decreased in my view, in large part because of the things we do for our employees. That's great. That's so great. You talked a little bit about um, the core principles, more in reference to employees and, you know, your internal culture. Um, I'd love to point to this uh, last slide that we've got here on uh, Deloitte fan survey. And we have four uh, core principles that la- they have laid out there. Um, it's very small writing. For, so for those that can't read it, uh, the first one being the view from my seat matches my expectations. Uh, the stadium facilities are clean, comfortable, and safe. The atmosphere of the stadium is exciting. And then finally, the quality of the competition I came to watch is compelling. Um, so, Jim, my question for you here is, you know, in meeting these core four principles um, referenced in this Deloitte survey, uh, what are some tips that you have found um, that really make a difference in putting on a great game, concert, uh, match, whatever the event is for the attendees? Well, I can't do anything about the competition on the field, right? <laughs> So, uh, but, but that matters, right? And so when, when you're in, when you're a leader in charge of making those types of decisions in terms of investing in your product, mm-hmm. uh, that, that slide there just goes to show what people are paying money for. And so not everybody's going to win, uh, but that's what they're coming for. And I think if you yeah. can, if you can uh, provide hope 
uh, or a sense that, that there's that we're they're trying or there's a pathway uh, and people believe in you, that's going to kind of solve for that um, for that bullet in terms of keeping people safe, clean, comfortable. You know, during COVID, uh, there was a little theater. I have to be honest with you. Right. There was there was over there's a little bit of an over correction uh but we needed to do that to to showcase uh to people that we do care about your safety and i want to address the concerns associated with it but before we knew much about covid people thought that was transmitted by you know particles on doorknobs and desks right and we learned since then that that wasn't the case but there's still there are still germs and things of that nature that wiping down those better uh, is helpful. And so seeing staff do that, and we still do this practice today, um, our disinfecting teams is what we call them, and we label them as such on their uniforms so people see that these are, that's their job. Where it used to be, you know, service-oriented folks, janitorial teams were not to be seen they're not to be heard. They were here, just get in, clean up, and get out of there. Customers don't want to see that. Well, that was a huge shift. Well, customers yeah, do want right. So customers do want to see that. And so we were we we kind of we did a few things different there uh, to make the stadium cleaner. I, I tapped into some technology that hospitals use with uh, UV lighting, where you can kill things on a micro level, on a microbiology level. Oh, wow. And so we started to introduce some of that stuff. So hospitals use that in, in um, you know, uh, emergency rooms and operating rooms, for example. So we use that sort of older technology, but in places where we never would have done before. In bathrooms, you go into the bathroom, you turn these these portable lights on, and and five minutes later, everything in there uh, is sterilized. Now, what comes behind it, um, you know, is 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 going to not be sterile anymore, oh. but it gave uh, that extra level to make them sure the, f- the facility was clean and comfortable for people. And I think those types of things helped. Lastly, I would say the atmosphere is not just driven by the play on the field. It's driven by the guests, your, you know, those internal customers that I, I talked about mm-hmm. and also your employees. And so um, giving your employees license to enjoy the show and to enjoy um, the arrival of people and the, and the customer and the customer experience um, is crucial. A perfect example of this: we held we had Elton John uh, just a couple I weeks saw ago. That. So cool! And employees, I, I said, dress up how you want. Yeah. <laughs> put your <laughs> boas on. Put your glasses on. Do all those stuff. I still think I have here. I still have a set of glasses. Oh my God! E- that's even amazing. I was, oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> right? And so I, I had a little bit more uh, rose-colored, uh, a little more flamboyant uh, right. kind of look to it. And seeing the boss walk around uh, that way uh, was—it um, was pretty fun for the employees to see that yeah. and to allow your employees to still have fun, but yet do your job helped create that atmosphere that I think people appreciated. So not only from the customer service standpoint, uh, but the, but the guests seeing those folks uh, mm-hmm. made them feel happy and engaged. And so you got to do that every now and then this week is um, salute to service. So let those folks wear something, you know, positive to, uh, you know, a military, or if you served in the military, take off your Levi stadium hat, and go ahead and put your 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 salute to service hat or your Marines insignia, whatever it is that you have, um, and celebrate that. That's to me is helping create the experience in a stadium uh, that that hopefully stands just a little bit out more so than maybe somebody else. Definitely. I love that. And you touched on a couple of incentives that are not only low in cost, but something that probably has a higher engagement rate at the end of the day, like 
the parking spots, you know, that's really not too much off your back. It means a ton to the cut or to the employees, of course, um, being able to dress in a spirited way, whatever, you know, the event is going on. I mean, at the end of the day, they're working at a stadium venue, which is so cool to, you know, end off the day with uh, being able to see a really amazing game, a concert like Elton John, something like that. Um, and I love that, you know, we're always talking about some incentives that aren't necessarily rooted in high monetary value. Um, so I think that's great. Uh, it's those little things. Remember, yeah, get back to basics. It's those little things that matter. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, to conclude, before we go over to some Q&A questions from the audience and those that have been emailed in, um, what are some, you know, tips, actions, or takeaways that you would recommend the audience to better manage their stadium or venue? Well, I, I think I'll, I'll harken back to uh, those three pillars of people, process, and technology, right? So mm -hmm. focus on those th three things and and properly weigh them. Technology is going to help you a lot, but it's not, it's not the end-all, be-all. And you don't always have to have the latest, greatest, newest, coolest uh, technology uh <laughs> right because if if you don't have the right people to to utilize that technology for one it's not going to serve you well mm -hmm. um if, if you when you look at process um process can cause brain damage you know and if you're not paying attention to um you know how 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 long it takes to get into the facility the steps that you're you're making people use in your um, people management system or your clock system, or um, you just don't make it as easy as possible. Getting them parking closer in, um, just hoops. You want to just remove as much friction for them as much as you do for your customer. Right. I think that's another tip. And but lastly, um, I'll always, always, always never forget that we are people and this business is about people and how you treat people will matter. And, and I think if you remember what mom and dad hopefully taught us uh, in some cases, maybe it's grandma or grandpa or, or any others in your life, whether it's um, not to get too deep, but whether it's religious based or whatever it is for you um, remember we are people and people like to be treated in such a way and in, in certain ways and in, in respectful ways. But if you can remember what it was like when you were growing up in this business and what it felt like to serve on a post two blocks from the stadium for eight hours in the cold or in the hot and nobody remembered you and forgot to bring you a, a water or mm -hmm. give you a break, maybe just maybe when you're a leader, you'll remember how to solve for that or right. what it meant, right? So don't forget where you came from, I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to tell you. Definitely. And just remember, people are going to make the difference um, in, if not every case, in most most cases. Yeah, that's great. Bo, I, I hate for you to follow that, but I, <laughs> you know, I want to hear what your one or two top takeaways uh, would be for our audience and to better managing their stadium or venue. Yeah, Meredith, you should start letting me go first. <laughs> <laughs> I really should. I got to you. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, Jim raises so many great points. Uh, I think the reality is that you cannot treat your employees like resources. Uh, you should be treating your employees like part of your team, part of your yourself. Uh, and I think that matters uh, for all industries, but in particular for that, that venue management. Um, and so that would be number one. Uh, number two would be uh, stay flexible, uh, have that technology to uh, provide you the opportunity to react quickly and make sure that you can maintain the uh, level of entertainment that you're seeking um, through that, uh, you know, visibility with technology. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. I would love to hop on to the Q&A portion for the last couple of minutes. Um, we had some people messaging in their questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Henry McGuire asks, how do, how do you maintain visibility of adjustments when you have a large group of fans or employees moving around the city? I'm, I'm sorry. Can you say that one more time? 
Yeah, of course. Uh, he said, how do you maintain visibility of adjustments when you have a large group of fans or employees moving around the quote unquote city? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll lean on the people process piece of it. Um, mm -hmm. You, you got to trust your people, right? And so there's a, there's a kind of a chain of command, so to speak. I also believe in that. Um, that allows your manager, your supervisor, your director, your area director, uh, it, it, one, it allows them to do their job, but somebody has to communicate that up. Somebody right. has to communicate that down and, and sideways. Um, and so I, I think, you know, there's a core individual, a core group of individuals I lean on uh, within my team in each one of those categories. So safety and security for one, um, I'm constantly getting updates. I don't have to be in, you don't have to be in it uh, as much as uh, you, in terms of on the front lines all the time, as long as you have somebody that's doing that for you, that you can trust and that's reporting back to you. So that, I think that's what I would, I would say, just keep constant uh, communication with your team. That's great. Bo, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I would definitely say uh, in those those infant stages, uh, lean on people who have also been uh, through those experiences. So as you move venues or you know move into new jobs, uh, mentorship I think is key. Seems like the uh, the industry is better than most with uh, supporting each other as they they go through that. So mm -hmm. that's great. Uh, Keith asked, how do you handle the high turnover of part time workers in the industry? Yeah, that, that just goes to basic, right? That your you your your foundation has to be strong. It's almost if you think about it as a police officer, a sergeant, a lieutenant, um, your office it, it shouldn't matter what officer you have mm -hmm. for the sergeant to manage that officer. You should be able to plug and play. And so if you're cross utilization with your training and things of that nature, you're in good shape. If you do not have a proper succession kind of planning, that's where you can be very vulnerable. So if you start losing your frontline staff, but also your manager, your senior manager, your, your director, and you don't keep filling the pipeline, that's where you're going to be a little bit more vulnerable uh, than I would like. Right. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I, I'll beat a, a dead horse there too and just mm -hmm. say the technology component of uh, knowing what exactly is occurring uh, with large venues, you're not going to know exactly uh, what's happening You know, on the other side of the building. It's a, a long walk away. Uh, and so having the, the technology to uh, you know, communicate properly, know what's occurring, uh, it's going to let you... Um, make quick decisions uh, and allow you to uh, utilize staff a little bit more leaner uh, when you have difficulties with that hiring. Right. Right. That's perfect. Um, we have time for one more question. We actually had a couple questions emailed in. Um, so this one from Christine B. She asked, how does your team handle employee shift changes and staff distribution across your stadium business businesses? So oh, do you, do you want to hit that one first? Do you, do you want me to do that? <laughs> go for it, Jim? Um, so the question was, how do I handle the staff? What uh, staff or employee shift changes and staff distribution across all components and aspects of the stadium businesses? Yeah. I mean, listen, some, so I think what that question is getting at is look, I don't want to work in the elevator today. I'd rather work yeah. down on the field. Right. <laughs> Well, I mean, you got to re just remember that there's only X amount of positions that are in in those key locations. Uh, but try to incentivize people uh, to enjoy each of those spots. And so, in other words, don't let you know. But there are some people that want to be on the elevator. So find, try to find folks and match them. It's almost like pairing weaknesses and strengths together on an everyday basis for a a full-time person or even a part-time person, right? Try to find what what they want to do. And if you can, uh, slide, slide them in that role. Mm -hmm. When you can't, you just got to communicate to them why you can't. Look, we, we're down 10, 15 people today. And as much as I'd love to keep you in that spot, 
I got to move you here or there. If you communicate that to people, for the most part, I think they're going to be uh, understanding and, ex- and accepting of it. If you just put them there and tell them, hey, go fill that spot, they're not going to be not going to appreciate you very much. Mm-hmm. So over communicate it. That's great. Bo, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say keep them flowing, too. Um, they don't have to, you know, if you're, you're working Section 105 or uh, something similar for, uh, you know, you can move them throughout the different layers of the building, uh, get different views, keep them moving. I think uh, difficulty arises when there's a lot of stagnation or you're standing in one place at one time, you know, letting people move around, I think, keeps things exciting, and mm-hmm. uh, keeps you engaged with, with you know, what's occurring in the given event. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I want to respect everybody's time as we're hitting that um, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time mark. Um, Before I let everyone go, I'd love to share the venue performance audit. Feel free to fill that out. Um, Again, we are are offering a lucky winner on a $100 Amazon gift card. Um, And before I let everyone go, Jim and Bo, thank you both so, so much for joining me today. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did too. And we will have to have a part two, hopefully in the near future. It'd be my pleasure. Thank you very much, Bo. I appreciate meeting you and uh, and and uh, thank you very much, Meredith. It was enjoyable. Appreciate it. Of course. Well, thank you as well, Jim. For coming on. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.